the notes. Morning, Michael. Good to see you. Good morning, Pastor Tim. Good morning, everyone. Pastor Bobby. Good morning, Michael. All right. Okay, so plan today is I want to make sure to give give us plenty of time to talk about the assignment. So we're just going to spend a, yes. a few minutes today on uh, some grammar just to keep that going. But I will give a, give a focus on our time with, um, with assignment three, the scene analysis, just to review uh, that. And then if you have any specific questions on your passage uh you're you're free to ask and we can take a quick look at, at your text so i'll leave i'll leave time for that to do that okay all right let's let's take a look at where we are as far as uh so our grammar exercises here um whoops i'm on the wrong document i want this one all right, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, last uh, time we were together, we, we looked at some of the basic building blocks of the nouns and verbs and adjectives, adverbs. Um, you can look at your notes to review that. What I wanna do now is go take a step back up. We've looked at the basic building blocks for clauses and phrases. Again, these are the nouns, verbs, adjective, adverbs. I want to go back a step up now and look at clauses and phrases a little bit more and review that uh, a little bit. And then we'll, we will continue on with the diagramming steps. And as you'll remember, every sentence, it contains at least one clause. Now, a clause is made up of a subject and verb. All right, and we covered this last week, so I'll just do a quick review. So just keep that in your minds. A clause, we're not talking about claws like an animal, right? We're talking about a clause that is in English, a C-L-A-U-S-E, not C-L-A-W-S. And a clause is basic a definition is simply a group of words that contain a subject and a verb. And again, a subject is simply a noun person, place, or thing, which carries out an action or about which a statement is made, all right? And the action or statement is made, that's the verb. So here's a couple of examples. A verb of act, there's two types of verbs, you'll remember. There's the verb of action. So we have Anselmo, that's the subject. Hit, that's the action, and then the ball. So Anselmo is the subject, hit is the action, that's a verb. It's a verb of action. Now, in the second example, uh, Arn was tired. This is not an action, but it is a verb in the sense that it is, it is describing, it is expressing the state or condition of the subject. Okay? So, Anselmo hit the ball, verb of action. Anselmo is the one doing the action, so he's the subject. In the second sentence, Arn was tired. Was is the verb and it's describing Arn here. It's not an action, but it's describing the subject. In this case, the subject was, was tired, all right? But the core, of when you wanna have a sentence or you have to have a clause and that clause must have a subject and verb, all right? That's at the core. If it doesn't have both a subject and verb, it's not a clause and it cannot present a complete thought, all right? So. Let's break this down further. Again, as I just said, there are two kinds of verbs, and these are not technical terms. These are just uh, ones that I came up with. There's more technical descriptions in grammar, but, but I often find when you use big words, they don't always help. So uh, simply put, there's verbs that describe an action and verbs that describe a state or a condition. All right. Now, if you have a verb of action, that means that there's a subject doing the action, there's the action itself, and often there is an object receiving that action or participating in it. That object it completes the thought. 
So you would have a subject, verb, and object. So again, in this sentence here, Anselmo, the subject, hit. All right, let's do this. Anselmo, the subject, again, the one doing the action, hit is the action. That's called the verb. And the ball is the object. That's what's receiving the action. Okay? So this is a, a simple sentence. It's a complete sentence. It describes a complete thought. Now, um, the second kind of verb, the verb of being, that does not take on an object, okay, as in this first case. Let's do this, right? Verbs of action have an object. There's something often receiving an action. There's something often participating in the action. That's why it's called an object, all right? The subject is the focus of the sentence. That's the one doing the action. The verb is the action itself, and then the object receives it. But in the sentences where it is a verb of being, you don't have an object. There's nothing receiving an action because there is no action. But in a ver with a verb of being, it often takes on what's called a predicate adjective or predicate noun to complete the thought. So for example, Arn was tired. Arn's the subject. Was is the verb, a verb of being. It's describing a state. And in this case, what is that state? Tired. So that completes the thought. And in this case, we don't call tired an object because it's not something that receives an action. What it is, is it's a word that describes the subject. And in this case, uh, it is an adjective. So we call it a predicate that is what uh, completes the action of the subject or the what the subject does, predicate adjective, all right? Arn was tired. Other examples might be Arn was, was tall. Why is this tall? Or Arn was hungry, right? Arn was happy. These are all adjectives. Look, he's smiling. He's happy, okay? Um, these are all <laughs> adjectives because they're, that's how they're defined in English. An adjective um, modifies a noun. Now, there are also, there's a second type of word that completes the thought when you have a verb of being, and that is a predicate noun. So, for example, Arn is a preacher. Now, preacher is not an adjective. It's actually a noun. It's, a, in this case, a person. Okay? Tired is not a noun. Tired is not a person, place, or thing. It's a characteristic. All right, so it's an adjective. But preacher is a noun. And so we call it a predicate noun. All right, and so you could also have, you know, Arn is a man, Arn is a father, a husband. Uh, you know, Arn is, a, is a, a worker. Okay, those are all nouns. And so they're called predicate nouns, meaning they complete the thought for a sentence, a clause, which contains a verb of being. Okay? So those are the mm -hmm. two the two categories, if you will, for a clause. Every clause has a subject. Every clause has a verb. But there can be two kinds of verbs. All right? There's not two kinds of subjects. There's one subject. The subject is either doing an action or the subject is being described. OK, and so when it's do when the subject's doing an action, that's when we have an object, something receiving the action. And that object will be, by the way, objects are always nouns. OK, as our subject subjects are always nouns. OK. Now, if the verb of being is. If it's a verb of being, then you don't have an object. You have either a predicate adjective, an adjective describing the subject, or a noun that's describing the subject. Okay? So hopefully that's review. We've, we've discussed this uh, before, but I want to make sure these are, these are hammered in. These are things that you really want to have a strong understanding of because it will help you with when we want to talk about clauses and phrases and what those do, and that will help you when we want to talk about diagramming and how those phrases and clauses connect to each other. As we went over last week, we went over an example from Ephesians 2 
of a diagram and uh, what that diagram can, can show you, okay? Now, I wanna go through a few examples with you of these, but before we do that, are there any, any questions that you guys have at this point? All right, let me ask you, Arn, how many kinds of verbs are there? Tell me the kinds of verbs. Just to review here. Uh, so far, good morning, Pastor. Good morning. Sorry for being late. Uh, there are two so far. You uh, as I have gone, uh, verb of action and verb of being. Okay, very good. Now, if you have a verb of action, uh, what what is the word called that completes? the thought in a sentence of subject verb and what does a verb of action take on to complete the thought uh object excellent now if you have a verb of being what is the word that follows that verb to complete the thought adjective it's called a, a predicate adjective okay, or a predicate predicate noun yes those are the two possibilities okay all right very good okay michael michael we're gonna have you uh we did these examples last week but i'm gonna have you do these examples here's examples of subjects with a verb of action all right so just tell us michael uh give us the subject and the verb and the object this one's straightforward <laughs> hopefully uh, unmute yourself too um they subject good noun it's then, a noun yep okay ran ran uh verb verb of action okay it is a verb of action and what does that make home then what um, is that called the, uh, it's an object uh, and what kind of what part of speech is home Noun. Noun. All right, good. Because again, here we have home is an object. Now, it's not receiving the action, but it's participating in it. All right. And in a sense, receives it, right? That's um, that's kind of the, the idea. It's a broad concept. And notice the object and the subject are both nouns. All right. Michael, yeah. let's give you one more. How about this sentence? He, noun, belong to noun, pronoun. Oh. Okay, and what, how is it functioning in this sentence? Subject. It's the subject, good. And All right. where's my verb? Reached. Yes, good. And what about these last two words? To is um what do you call that uh, uh sermons um object okay sermons is the object noun and it's a noun and good now what about that word too what is that doing um what do you call that uh the one describing the noun yes what are those called? Remember, we're back to our four basic. We have the noun, uh, the verb, the adjective, and the adjective. adverb. Adject adjective. Yeah, the adjective is, describes describing. the noun. And, 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 and it answers the question, how many? Yeah, in this case, two answers the question, how many? Okay, adjectives can tell you how many, which one. Uh, what kind? All right. And verbs answers the questions of where, when, why, how. Okay. So in this case, two is telling us it's an adjective. It's telling us how many. Okay. But the key, the key words here in this sentence, in this clause is the subject, because that's the thing doing the action. The verb is the action and object is receiving the action. Okay. All right. Well, 
uh, let's see. A Alex, we'll have you do this one. Identify the subject, verb, object. Sid taught the class yesterday. Sid is the... No. Forget. Okay. First, um, if Sid you have trouble, identify the action or the verb. Class. Where's the verb here? The verb is taught. Okay. And is, is that a verb of action Teach. or being? Verb. It's a verb of action. So who's doing verb the action? Ac Sid. So that make, what does that make Sid? The, what is the thing that does the action called? Uh, <laughs> I forgot. No problem. Anyone want to help? Subject. Yeah, the subject. I will okay. subject. The okay, subject. Okay, subject. Remember, subject. The subject. I can spell. Verb. The subject does the action. The verb is the action. And the object receives the action. Okay. Okay. So in this case, what is receiving the action? Is there anything receiving the action? Uh, class. Class. Good. Plus. Okay, so that's my object. The object. Now, what is this yeah. word yesterday? How is that working in this sentence here? Uh, what are you doing? Answers uh, when, the question when. Yes, very good. Okay. And so what does that mean? Uh, what is? How do we uh, describe that word then? Adverb. If it's answering when, what did we call that? Uh, adverb. Yep. Oops. Adverb. It's telling yes, us adverb. when when the class was taught. Okay. Good. And the is the is called the the article. Def artic okay. Definite article. The definite article. Just to name all the terms there. Okay. Very good. Uh, Alex, let me give you one more. And now we're going to look at sentences where the sure. verb is a verb of being. Okay. So again, what's the subject, the verb? And in this case, it's going to be a predicate adjective or predicate noun. Okay, the subject is sermon. Good. Uh, what is the verb? Good. And if you're not sure, just ask uh, yourself, is, is good a noun or an adjective? It's, adjective. It's an adjective, right? It's not a noun. So it's a predicate adjective. adjective. We'll call that a PA. Predicate, predicate adjective. Predicate adjective. Because okay. good, good is uh, completes the thought and tells us uh or describes the sermon the sermon was because you can't say this the sermon was that doesn't present a full thought right but but to say the sermon was good now i have a complete thought and that word good is what? telling us something about the sermon and in this case good is not a noun so it must be an adjective it's a predicate adjective in this case all right all right okay. good alex uh james we're gonna ask you i'm gonna ask you to do do this one yes okay Pastor is Okay. Ask yourself the question: Is pastor a noun or an adjective? Um, a noun. 
Yeah, it's a noun. So in this case, it's a predicate noun. Okay. Because it describes Alan. And by the way, the verb is, is, correct? All right. And then in this case, I have an article there, which modifies pastor. All right. Uh, James, go ahead and do this one as well. She is the subject, is the verb, and happy is the All right. <laughs> well, ask yourself if you're not sure, just ask yourself the question Is that word a noun or an adjective? Is it a noun? Yeah, it's not a noun, right? So it's got to be an adjective. Right now, yeah, if I, had, if I had said she, it's a predicate adjective. If I had said she is a woman, now woman is a noun, right? So in that case, you'd have a predicate noun. All right, or... Uh, she is a mother, or she is a um, she is uh, a um, house worker. Okay, that's worker is a noun, right? Those are so those are nouns. So if you're not sure, just ask yourself if that last word there is this a noun? Okay, in this case, happy. That's not a noun, so it must be an adjective. Okay, it's a it's describing a characteristic. James, let's give you one more. Then I'll pick on somebody else. My son my son Okay, became is is the verbs technically, but is it a verb of action or being? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a verb of being because became yeah. is a state, it's a condition, it's a mode. Okay. Uh, man is a son. Is yeah, what is son subject? here? Son is the subject. Good, that's what's being described. And what is man? Yeah. Is that an man object? Is, is that an object? No. It's not. How? No. Why? Why not? Why is it not an object? It's a noun. Okay, it is a noun. Yeah. But is it the subject of this, or uh, is it the object of this sentence? Uh, uh, no. Okay. I, I guess, yeah. I'm just, I'm just in, in. Okay, let's remember what is an object. An object is receives the action. Okay, so that means we must have a verb of action. Do we have a verb of action here? Is, be, is became a verb of action? Come on. <laughs> Okay, well, just think about, it. is it describing an action? When you say something uh, becomes or became something, uh, 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 it's uh, describing a mode of, of being. It's describing a state, okay? He's not, the sun is not doing something. The sun became something. Uh, okay, that's a, that's a, in this case, no, it's it's a verb of being. Okay. Became is a little tricky because it's not. There's a difference between saying I am a man or I became a man. Right. I am a man is present state. I became a man describes the process. But in both cases, these are both verbs of being. They're describing the, the state or condition of something. So became is a little more tricky. 
but it is still in the class of verbs of being. Okay, so in this case, man is not an object because the verb is not an action verb. It's a verb of being. And you are, you are correct. You, you noted that it is a noun, so that makes this a predicate noun in this case. Okay. Okay? Does that make sense, James? Okay. Makes okay, sense, good. but James. Thank you. Thank you. Became. <laughs> yeah, became, became a man. Yeah, became a or become. Uh, those are a little tricky, but they still are verbs of being. All right. Okay. Just like am, is, was, were, okay, will be. Those are also verbs of being. All right. He was a no. He was formerly gay. Formerly gay? I yeah. don't get it. Then he be he became a man. Oh man, became a man, yeah. Well, I was thinking, <laughs> I was thinking more of a boy becoming a man. <laughs> I'm just I'm just kidding. That's it. Yeah. All right. Uh let's see here. Alan, we'll we'll have you do the next one here. He is a believer. He is the noun. It's a noun. Okay. He is a noun. Correct. It's a pronoun. It's in the class of nouns. What is it? How is it functioning in the sentence here? Uh, it's the subject. Good. Now, how about, where's the verb? The verb is is. Yep. And that's a verb of action being. or being? being? Being. All right. And so what does that make believer here? What is that in this sentence? Um, he is a believer. Uh, it's, a, it's a predicate. Again, just simply ask, is this a noun or an adjective? Is it a noun? Is a believer uh, a noun? Uh, is that a person, place, or thing? Uh, or a characteristic? It's an adjective. All right. Actually, in this case, it is a noun. Um, uh, okay. Believer, right? Uh, a Christian. If I had said a Christian, right? That's a noun, right? the same uh same thing now if i had said he is a a uh um or he is let's see what would be a similar word he is believable okay that is an adjective it's a description word but believer, that's describing a person, right? A person is a believer. So that'd be a noun in this case. So it's a predicate noun. All right. How about, how about faithful? A certain, he is yeah, faithful. He is faithful. So that's faithful a, that's a noun. A yeah, it's a predicate. You have a subject. He, verb is, faithful is a predicate, but is it a noun or an mm -hmm. adjective? So you first ask, is faithful a noun? Is it a person, place, or thing? All right. You, it's like an adjective. It, it's an adjective. It's, 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 an adjective. it's a descriptor, characteristic. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's it, not it, a noun. it also... It also sounds like a noun. I know, no, no. It's an adjective. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes it could be used as a noun. Yeah. Well, let's look at I had an example here of it actually. Do this one, Alan. They are faithful servants. 
Day is the subject. All right, good. R is uh, the verb. Now, I servants. Did. Yes. Uh, go ahead. What do you do with these two words? Uh, uh, it's a predicate. Servants is noun. Yes. So what is predicate that? Noun. Good. It's a predicate noun. Adjective. Faithful it, is adjective. Yes. Faithful is an adjective modifying servants in this case. Now, if I had just said they are faithful, I would have a subject, verb, in this case, the predicate adjective, because in the second sentence, faithful completes the thought. It's describing they. But the first sentence, faithful is describing servants, and servants completes the thought. They are servants. And in that sentence, this first one, we added the idea of what kind of servants. That's why faithful is an adjective. Okay, it's answering the question, what kind? But servants is my, my noun. And servants is what completes the, the idea of they are. They are servants. And in this case, we are told what kind of servants. All right, so that, that's a little tricky here. But notice the difference between these two sentences. That's this is where, yeah. you know, the context, so to speak, we, we got to look at all the words to help us understand how they are working together in this sentence. In the second sentence, we're only to it's they are faithful. So the faithful is completing the thought. But in this sentence, it's servants that completes the thought and faithful simply is a description of what kind of servants they are. OK, we could have said uh, they are happy people. Same idea here. People com completes the. Um, it's a noun, right? People, person, place or thing. It's persons. So it completes the idea. They are people. And we're also told they are happy people. All right. But if I had said simply they are happy, I have the same thing as I did above. I have the subject again as they, verb is, is are, and a predicate adjective because this is what completes the thought. All right. So keep an eye out for that. Certain we can reverse, you know, the faithful are servants. Yeah, you could say uh, the servants are faithful. Yeah, in this case, we've turned things around a little. Now this, the subject in this sentence is servants. The verb is our and faithful is the adjective describing the servants. What percentage if we reverse it? The faithful are servants. If we put it that way. Okay, so you tell me. Okay, so faithful becomes the subject. Yeah. It is, uh, it is being used now as a noun. Yes. Don't you mm. love English? And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why I said earlier it sounded like a noun. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and the only way, you know, that can help you is you got to think, how is it being used in the sentence? What is the word order? <laughs> Okay, because in English, word order can help you. So what it comes before the verb is, you know, is normally the subject, unless you're dealing with Hebrew poetry um, or poetry, English poetry. And so in this case, we know faithful is a noun because one, remember, a key clue that you have a noun is the presence of an article. article second clue it's the first word in the sentence the first uh, noun it's the it's the 
uh, it begins the sentence, and it's, so it's likely the subject in this case. Whereas here, the servants are faithful. Servants is what begins a sentence. We know servants is a noun. It's never used. It's never used otherwise. And so, and then again, we have the word the, which is a pointer to the noun, to a noun. All right. Or we could have had, uh, you know, also remember for articles, you just simply have there are uh, two kinds. There's the definite article. In the, okay, in the indefinite article. Ah. Indefinite. Yeah, so the definite article the. is the, all right? That is refers to a specific noun, all right? Uh. The pastor, the husband, all right? The car. It's a specific one being identified. It's def that's why it's called definite, whereas indefinite is more general. A or an, right? A pastor. Okay, that's... That's a general statement. A, a pastor preaches, right? A pastor preaches. That's speaking of a, a general, that's a general thought. But if you say the pastor preaches, now you're referring to a specific one. Okay. Pastor Tim. Yeah. Uh, may I give uh, an example? Sure. That'd be great. Go ahead. The, the servants are happy. Okay. Then we can have a reverse sentence. The happy are servants. Yeah. Now here, you're, you're, there's an implied noun <laughs> there. Okay. Uh, but you're referring the is a specific group you're referring to. And I say group because servants is plural here. Um, normally, have, this, this is an awkward, so yeah, they ahead. will not have the same implication with the pitfall because the pitfall cannot be a noun. It's, it remains an adjective. That's well, why I give that as a counter example. In this, in this sentence, the faithful, uh, the faithful is being described as, yeah, you know, the implication is faith, like faithful ones, but because of the article, um, so there, you know, you have an uh, implied that some noun being referred to. So you have to, we need more context, right? Uh, we need other sentences to help us out because probably what you would have, you know, is a sentence talking about Christians, for example, and then it refers to them as the faithful. Um, then we know in that context who it is being described as faithful, but, but just from a grammatical perspective, uh, understanding because we have an article it is making the faithful a noun in this case and this is what happens in english a lot words can be used uh, and, and changed you know i could have said uh the believing ones are happy right and in this case believing is a verb that i've turned into a noun or into this case uh, uh, an adjective describing ones all right. So it is, uh, you know, can get fairly complicated. So, yes, you could say mm. technically the happy are servants and happy is normally an adjective. But when you do this, when you put an article in front of it, now you're referring to a specific group, uh, in this case, group and calling that and you're referring to them as the happy and implied is mm. like the happy ones <laughs> or, you know, we don't have more context. So. It's Pastor hard. Tim, yeah, the, thank you for the, the arrangement of Pastor. it. The arrangement of it grammatically makes it a noun, something like that. Well, Although well, you need more uh, context to understand it, but the very arrangement of it uh, makes it a noun. Well, how about it this? depends on it depends on how you how you frame your your sentence. Partly. Or how do you see it? Yeah, partly. Because look at this second one. Yeah. 
Happy are the servants. In this case, happy is clearly an adjective. I just reversed the sentence. So servants is still my subject in this, in this sentence. Happy is a predicate adjective. The verb is are and servants is my subject in this one. You guys see that? Mm -hmm. But Sid's example, he said the happy. All right. Now that's what um, brings uh, complicates it a little bit, because now by saying the I'm referring to a specific uh, group of people. And instead of calling them the happy ones, if I just said the happy, mm -hmm. I'm referring and there's going to be context because this, you know, we're talking about one sentence in isolation, but normally there'll be a context and I'll know who the happy are. You know, let's say we had something where um, one one that's it. Is the man. Happy is the man. That's it. Yeah, yeah. You've got like uh, um, shoot the beatitudes, right? Happy or blessed, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. right? Blessed mm -hmm. are those who mourn. Uh, blessed are the persecuted. Right. These are examples of where I've put the predicate adjective at the beginning of this, or Jesus did in this case, at the beginning of the sentence. Blessed are those, and those is my subject. Who mourn modifies the subject. Okay, this is... All right, but it's not... Now, if we were to say the blessed are persecuted mm -hmm. i have now made blessed a noun mm -hmm. and i've made it then the subject <laughs> of this sentence mm -hmm. all right so um i'm i'm you know i don't mean to complicate things but you know, this is where knowing that article and what it does, an article gives can help you identify uh, what part of speech. And then normally you have we don't have sentences by themselves. They're with a group of sentences. And so that help that context will help us identify that really, like, for example, you wouldn't have the happier servants. There will be something else in the paragraph that will identify who are the happy that he's talking about. And so there's there's like an implied, you know, let's say, you know, the, the paragraph's talking about children, you know, so we would know that the happy here refers to the children, but they're just called the happy. Um, they're given an identity, which makes it a noun. All right. The Pastor Tim, yeah. is it safe to say that the article all the more reinforces that it is a noun? Yes. The, yeah. the, 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 the article, the definite article. That's what makes it a noun. Yeah. Okay. In this That's sentence. In this sentence. All right. <laughs> Keep that in mind. That yeah. Yeah. General, like I said, okay. the next the next sentence, happy are the servants. Happy is not a noun there. It's a description mm -hmm. of the servants. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. But All you right. can think in mm -hmm. your mind, you know, I would think in my mind, the happy ones. So technically, it's what's implied, you know, ones is, is a noun, but we wouldn't know who he's referring to without more, more sentences to give us the context. Mm. Uh, Pastor Tim, uh, may I ask, for example, in that reverse uh, order, happy are the servants, uh, is it also safe to say that the article the servants okay, is significant in identifying the part of speech there? Okay. Yeah. The verb, the subject, and the predicate adjective. Yeah, and and we know servants, you know, almost always that's a noun. That's just by knowing what the, the word itself, the definition. Yeah. But the okay just reinforces that that it's functioning as a noun in this sentence and knowing the other uh -huh. words in the sentence my verb and then that first word happy again i know happy is generally a description it's describing the servants here that's why it's an adjective but sid 
wanted to stir up some trouble here. So he asked about the happy, <laughs> but that's a really okay. good question. I think that was a good yeah. point that he was bringing up that, um, you know, to, so yeah. yeah, what I mean Pastor Tim is, so it's, it's now identified as the subject okay? and not a direct object or not an, not a, what a predicate noun. Uh, it is, it is now identified or labeled as a subject and not a predicate noun. Yeah, in in the in this sentence above here, yeah. In that the, sentence, yeah. The happy, because okay. the is the article, and then happy is now the subject. And because it's the subject, it has to be a noun. Okay. In right. this sentence. In yeah, I want to I want to stress that. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. Because almost an, always the word happy is an adjective. But because we've given it a special identification here in this sentence by saying the happy, I'm telling you in this sentence, I'm referring to a specific uh, group of people. Okay, but I'm calling that group the happy. I could have said the happy ones. I could have said the happy children. I could have said the happy uh, men. But I just said the happy. So I have now made happy a noun by referring to some group and i call a group mm. because servants here is plural um mm. but so i've i've really forced this adjective to act differently now because i put this article here mm -hmm. okay so pastor pastor tim another question follow up here's a classic case of a reverse order and we we encounter those things from time to time, right? Well, yeah, we, we, we look at the, the the Sermon on the Mount, right? Blessed the mm, Beatitudes. Yeah. yeah. Blessed okay. are those who mourn. But in this case, blessed is the predicate adjective. And we could say those, those who mourn are blessed. All right, that's the... And this, this more clearly identifies my subject, my verb, and my predicate adjective. Now, if I put an article here, guess what I just did? I turned this into a noun. Mm -hmm. Because now I'm identifying a group. Because I know it's a group because those is plural. If I had said he, if I had said, you know, he who mourns is blessed now i know blessed is or the blessed all right that's that would now indicate blessed in that case it's referring to he whoever he is and i'm calling him the blessed you know in fact um well i don't want to get into that so so here it's important to kind of pay attention to articles it's important you know word order is helpful but it's not it's not uh, sufficient to give us a full understanding mm -hmm. and we need more context to help us do that but often in poetry and this is why jesus did this it's more poetic to say blessed are those who mourn it's more poetic to sort of reverse the order and it also gives emphasis to that first word he's emphasizing blessed in this case so he moves that word to the beginning or if i were to say happy are the servants I'm really emphasizing that the happy part. All right. So, but in poetry, often word order is changed in order to give it a more aesthetic, creative, artistic um, uh, feel. All right. So Jesus is speaking poetically, I believe, in the Beatitudes. I think it's because it's a more, it evokes more emotion. It's a more beautiful way to express it. And also, I think he does it in order to give emphasis to the word blessed, because he also he repeats that, doesn't he, all the way through. So mm -hmm. I think those are the two reasons why Jesus puts the predicate adjective at the beginning. And I know it's a predicate adjective because there's no article. And so he's giving this in this case. Here's a way we might be able to think about it. Uh, blessed is a description of the subject. 
if I were to say the blessed, now I'm actually calling them, I'm identifying them as a group with this particular name, the blessed. Some Bible translation, Pastor Tim, use happy instead yeah. of blessed. Yeah, and happy is, um, does not, does not, incorporate the full idea of what it, when a Jew said blessed um, well let me see when a Jew said blessed right there's two there's two Hebrew words that he could be referencing there's one, one called um, Shalom right you refer you familiar with this right the idea here it's often used as a greeting it, it means peace prosperity um contentment it's this it's a very holistic idea of of a of a a good life right a good life which includes not just happiness it includes wealth it includes prosperity it includes peace it includes contentment all right that's one idea then there's another one that uh it's pronounced ashray and that has the idea of happy envied like you want you want to be that guy all right and so um happy is really too too simplistic i think here i don't think jesus is just talking about happy i think he's talking about the shalom idea of this fully orbed rich complete full life that includes happiness right it includes that part but i think I think he was speaking more of this Jewish concept of um, of shalom. All right. Now, happy is not a bad translation. It's not a wrong translation, but I think it's a it's a simplistic one. I don't think it captures the full. Because uh, Jesus is not just saying, you know what, you're happy when you're persecuted. No, he's saying you are you are blessed. You are one who is in a, um, uh, a state of richness, of peace, of prosperity, because you're in right standing with God, right? He's describing here in the Beatitudes, those who are Christians, those who are kingdom citizens, those who are, are the children of God. And he's describing what they are like. They are those who mourn, uh, those who are persecuted, uh, those who are uh, humble, right, meek, mm -hmm. um, all of those things. So I would I would say happy again is probably it's a good word, but it's not a complete enough word to describe. I think what Jesus is telling us there. But, yes, sir. Can I ask? Uh, it can we take a specific example from the Bible? I have I have a verse in mind, and this is regarding the article. Yep. How the article uh, pinpoints uh, something. So John chapter three verse ten regarding Nicodemus. Yeah. Good. Go ahead. So he uses the definite article there. He says, are you the teacher? And then um, in Logos, it has uh, a, a sort of footnote there, reference. So he uses a definite article and not an indefinite article. So that, that changes the whole meaning of that word teacher, right? Well, what it does is, yeah, by him saying, are you the teacher of Israel? And notice, here's the Greek article. I don't know if you can see the mm -hmm. highlight there. Um, mm -hmm. That's the article, the. So, yeah, oh. if he if he had not, it's called ha. If he had not put ha there and just had, um, sorry, that's not it here. It's down here. The, the, uh. the teacher, didaskalos is teacher. Uh. Uh. Didasko is the verb to teach. So if he had just said, uh, you know, didaskalos, you are a teacher of Israel, mm -hmm. um, that would have a different 
weight than that. Yeah, he uses the article, which some believe then identifies him as a prominent known uh, teacher. And in some cases, some some say that, you know, that means he's probably the mo foremost teacher yeah. or instructor. Uh, and, and I think that's a fair that that would be a, a reasonable um a reasonable conclusion okay so yeah every word matters right and so by saying mm -hmm. the teacher that's a good observation and you can see in the greek if you go to an interlinear you'll see right yes. we can do that in fact let's just do that mm -hmm. um you know if you're not sure if because sometimes in english they'll put an article in there that's not in the greek all right mm -hmm. and so it can be helpful to to look at the greek now the problem here is articles sometimes in greek the article is implied even if it's not written so you've got to be careful with this all right you need to have more understanding of greek to be more uh, certain about these things but in this case you can at least look and see if there is an article then it's confirmed so here let's look at john 310 in the interlinear um yeah. okay hopefully you guys can see that here everybody see uh see the interlinear on your screen yeah you guys all see that okay so let's take a look right um jesus jesus answered and said you there's my personal pronoun are there's my verb of being and then notice ah there's the article in greek the so you can confirm to yourself there is an article now what if we had looked here and there was no article and the english translation just had the teacher of israel um that's when you might you have to be careful it, it may be implied there's a definite article or it may not be but in this case we know there is because it's there so you don't have to worry about that. So I think it is fair to say Jesus is speaking to him as, you know, you're a specific teacher of Israel, perhaps the most prominent one, the, the, the greatest teacher in Israel in his day. That's, that's a possibility. Um, now, if there was no article, then it would be you are a teacher of Israel. Most likely. This one among. Yeah. You're one of, of many teachers. But by saying the teacher, that does indicate there's something specific that Jesus is identifying him as. All right? Mm -hmm. So that's, a, that's an important and good observation. Okay. All right, good. Any other questions on this? Pastor yeah, Pastor Noor. When you talk about past reserve, is it another topic we have to deal with or it's still there? The passive verbs. Passive? Yeah, mm -hmm. passive verbs. Um, let me go back to my. Okay. So um, you asked about passive verbs. Is that what you're asking? Is that right? Passive? Nor? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, remember, verbs take on certain characteristics. Words. They can be passive or active. And remember, for active verbs, that means the subject is doing the action. So, Anselmo hit the ball. The subject here Anselmo. is Anselmo. And the verb is hit. He's doing the action. Or in the passive mode. I'm in the active mode. And in this case, it's active because the subject is doing the action. Okay, so in this case, hit is active because the subject's doing the action. Now, passive verbs, a 
passive verbs, the sub the action is being done to the subject. Now you might say, wait a minute, I thought that was an object. Well, let me give you an example. And you'll see the difference. So here, Anselmo hit the ball. Ball's the object, right? Now, what if if the sentence was Anselmo was hit? Yeah, was hit by the ball. By the ball. Now, in this case, Anselmo is still the subject, but, and the verb is still was hit, but notice it says was hit. And then we have a further clue by the ball. So, ball is no longer the object. Now, by the ball is a phrase, an adverb, adverb which, is, phrase. which is acting like an adverb. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. But now the subject is still Anselmo. But in this case, the action is being done to him. He's not doing the action. Uh, a very important passage. I, I don't remember if we've looked at before where this, this question is actually an excellent question and a very important one to pay attention to when you're doing study. Okay, so Ephesians 5.18. You guys know this text, right? Mm -hmm. Ephesians 5.18. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. But, and what does Paul say there? Yeah. Be filled, Be filled. Be filled. by Be the Spirit. Holy Spirit. Okay, and we notice there that um, that be filled is a verb, and it's an action verb. Filled is an action, but the question we need to ask ourselves is what kind of verb? Is it a passive verb or an active verb? Is the subject doing the action, or is the action being done to the subject? Okay, now that little, in, in English, in English, this little word be gives us, um, tells us that in this case, the action, so, okay, the subject is you, correct? Yeah. You, yes, you, be filled with, uh, the, the, con the conjunction uh, signals as it's starting a new sentence. Correct. A new clause. And it's two things he says. Do not get drunk with wine. That's the first command. And then the second is be filled. So the subject is you. The verb is be filled. And then there is no object here. In this case, we have a phrase because notice it's introduced by a preposition. With. Or you could translate it uh, by. I think by is a better one. OK, but notice here, be filled. That is that verb is actually passive. Because of that word be. It, he doesn't say you fill with the spirit. Now, right, that would be a different that would be saying I fill something with the spirit. Right. That's active, me doing the action in this case, right? This would be active verb because I'm, you know, or you, you fill. That is, you do the action. And here, you fill with the spirit. So it would be me taking the spirit and filling something with him. Now, that doesn't sound right, <laughs> right? <laughs> Theologically, but... But even grammatically, that's not what Paul says. He says, you be filled with the Spirit. So it is the subject you is receiving, is, is, being, is the actions being done to the subject in this case. That's why it's called passive. You know, passive means you just, right, you sit there and something happens to you. That's passive, right? Like bad husbands, mm -hmm. right? They're passive. They just kind of <laughs> let things happen. They don't take action. But active means that I do something. I'm the one doing the action. Passive means the action's being done to me. Right? You see the difference? 
So in this sense, mm -hmm. in this verse, be filled is what's happening to the subject. You, Paul says, be filled. He didn't say you fill. That would be active. He says you be filled. And then mm -hmm. he says how is, is uh, by the spirit. All right. The very important distinction here. Again, because if he had said you fill with the spirit, that's me then taking the spirit and filling something with him. All right. Which is, is not only not what he's saying, it'd be theologically a, a wrong. <laughs> I don't tell the spirit to do anything. <laughs> right. So. So the grammar is important here. And to even just seeing what kind of verb I have, I have an active or passive verb. That means it is actually the spirit I'm being filled with or by the spirit. All right. So I'm not the one doing the filling. The spirit is. The other translation said be uh, controlled. Yeah. By <clears throat> Yeah, the idea of be controlled by the spirit is sort of, I think, uh, what he's conveying here. Uh, if you look at uh, that word fill, uh, the filling of the spirit, we see um, we see examples of it all through scripture, Old Testament and New, and that usually the, the filling of the spirit was the Holy Spirit coming upon someone to empower them to do something. Mm -hmm. Right, we see examples of it in Exodus, even with the uh, Bezalel and Oh Oho Oholiab. They were filled by the Spirit to build the tabernacle. It says explicitly in um, Exodus, I forget the chapter. I just read it a couple days ago, but it says there that the Spirit filled those two men and to empower them to complete an important task. And so I think the idea of filling is is the idea of this of you uh, yielding yourself to the spirit's control so that he would empower you to do something. Mm -hmm. And in this case, we keep reading in the context in Ephesians five to find out what we're being empowered to do. And that's when we're given all the instruction on husbands, wives, children, slaves, masters, all of that comes out of this command. Mm -hmm. Amen. And maybe uh, maybe in a week or two, I can sh show that to you. But you can go back to the text and you can see it. In fact, mm -hmm. I'll just show you direct from the passage real quick. And then we got to go to uh, our assignment discussion because um, I don't want to miss that this week. But notice here. Amen. Notice he has two commands. <laughs> Do not get drunk with wine. Command number one. So don't put yourself in a position to be influenced by alcohol rather put yourself in a position to be filled by the spirit to be under his control and what does that produce well that's what 19 verses 19 and 20 through 21 tell us when you are filled by the spirit you'll be speaking to one another in psalms and hymns you'll be singing and making melody with your heart to the lord you will be giving thanks you will be subject to one another all right. And notice be subject is actually a participle as well. So verses 19 through 21 actually tell us five results of being filled by the spirit. Mm -hmm. OK, let's just look at the context. And then that last result being subject to one another. That's what leads Paul into these instructions to wives and husbands and children and parents. OK, because he's saying this is what it looks like to be subject to one another in the home. How we serve one another, right? Even though husbands are leaders, do you realize men, when you lead in love, you're actually being subject to your wife because you are serving her, even though you're leading her. Okay, it sounds ironic. It sounds contradictory, but, but actually both husband and wife in the home are functioning in roles of being subject to each other, the wife by being following the husband's leadership, but the husband is serving and coming uh, is, is uh, serving his wife by leading her in love. Leadership by service. Leadership by service. 
And that is a form of being subject. Okay, it doesn't mean we obey our wives or we are under our wives, but we are to be servants to our wives. And that is an expression of being subject and ultimately being subject to what God wants. And that happens, how? By being filled by the Spirit. You know, we cannot love, we cannot lead in love like Jesus did without the Spirit's empowering. Forget it, right? And wives, brothers, you guys are wonderful men, but listen, your wife, your wives, it'd be impossible for them to submit to you if, unless they're empowered by the Spirit to do that. You know, we, we, you're nice guys, but, but you're not perfect guys. Right. We're not perfect husbands. It's hard to it's hard for our wives at times. So that's why they need the spirit to empower them to to be the wives that God's called them to be. And same for we children. We need prayers on that. Yeah. I think we, we need all, prayers on that. Yeah. <laughs> I think we all do. <laughs> our our wives are becoming like Jezebel now. <laughs> Uh, that's not their fault. <laughs> God forbid. <laughs> so, okay. Well, let's let's leave that there because I, I I do want to make sure we give some time to our uh, next assignment since we've put that off a couple weeks. So let me pull that up. We can continue with this uh, discussion next week, but for now, let me pull up the. Assignment example here. Okay. Now, again, you've done this before, um, but I know it's been a while. So we we'll just review some of these steps. Again, remember here that uh, in scene analysis, and you can go back in our discussions, you go all the way back to our session six through nine. If you want to get a thorough review of scene analysis, uh, go there. You can look at the notes, but also uh, the, those are the videos. And then in scene analysis, the steps are, if you remember, there's three steps. The first is to divide up the story into its scenes. All right. And remember, a new scene is defined by a change in time or in place. And sometimes it's a change in characters. Depends on the story. Okay. Okay. So that's the first step is go read through the story several times and try to identify where do I see in the story a change in time or a change in place or location, or perhaps it's a change in characters. Okay, so look for clue words like the next day or, you know, um, you know, the and the sixth hour or uh, they went to Galilee or right in in the temple right those are all those are time words those are place words look for that because that's giving you a clue as to whether or not there's been a change in the time or the place and then sometimes as we saw in john 4 there's a change in characters it's the same location but the people change right first it was the woman at the well and then she leaves and the disciples come then it's Jesus and the disciples. So they're at the same place, um, but it was a change in the people involved. And then in the third scene, it is now the Samaritans come. And then Jesus goes with them to the village and he stays there a couple of days. So, um, so it can be any one of those three things. All right. Once you've identified the scenes in your story, then... Go through each of the six, these six uh, aspects. The setting, which you've already done, so just write it down. What is the time? What is the place? Um, who are, and then the key characters. Who was in that scene? And then important dialogue. And again, remember, that is dialogue in the scene that looks to you to be important to, to the scene. All right? And that, that's just up to your judgment. And then do not neglect the narrator comments. All right. Identify things that the narrator says that are significant, at least seem to be significant to you. All right. And then after you've done that, you've identified the setting, you've identified the key characters, you've uh, indicated key statements made by the characters. Then 
and you've noted the narrator comments that are important, then just summarize that scene in a sentence. Jesus talks to the Samaritan woman about living water or something like that. Okay? And then the last aspect is just any general comments or observations, maybe things that might not fit in these first five aspects that just things you notice okay and then step three is simply just collect those summaries together um, so i'll show you what, what i mean by that in a minute okay so these are the three steps identify the scenes or the setting then these note the these six aspects in that particular each scene and then finally once you've done all the scenes and summarized all the scenes uh, collect those summaries together and that will sort of retell the story in just a few sentences. Okay? Those are the steps. Now, if we look at John 1, and I was going to have us read it, but for the sake of time, um, I'm just going to show you the results. You'll have to, to read it on your, on your own. Okay? Um, in step one... Well, maybe, let me see. Let me see. Yeah, let's, let me just do this. Okay, so on step one, I'm, I'm just identifying the scenes. Okay? And so what that means is I'm just looking for a change in setting. And as I go through the story, I notice in verse, here, let's do this. Okay, and I notice, okay, verses 1 to 6 describe the, the setting. And notice it says where Jesus is in Samaria, near a town called Sukkar, near a parcel of ground that Jacob gave to Joseph, and specifically they're at Jacob's well, and then he gives the time. All right, so the author gives us the, the setting here, and then it says in verse 7, there came a woman. So now we have the time setting and the location. Now we have another person enter the story. So it's Jesus and the Samaritan woman. And it's around the sixth hour, okay, at around noontime. Okay? And so they are there at noon at Jacob's well, and they get into this conversation. And that conversation goes from verse 7 all the way to verse 26. And you remember they talk about the living water, they talk about true worship. They talk about the Messiah at the very end where Jesus says, I am the Messiah. Okay. And then verse 27, they're still at the well. It's still, you know, sometime around noon. But at this point, the disciples came and notice it says in verse 28, the woman left. So the disciples show up. The woman goes back to, to town. So now we're in the same place but now it's a change in character so i i see that as another scene so to speak okay even though it's the the same place and around the same time now we have a different different characters interacting so verse 27 i believe is a change in the scene all right and they the disciples in jesus interact there's dialogue and then we come to verse 39 where the Samaritans show up. And then the Samaritans, it says, ask Jesus to stay with them two days. So verses 39 to 42, I say, form another scene where the Samaritans come, Jesus follows them back to town, and Jesus stays with them a couple of days. Okay? Now, let's say that you're, uh, you know, we did an example from John 1. Uh, some time ago, and it began with the testimony of John the Baptist, and then we get to verse 29, and notice it gives a time marker, the next day. So that's a new scene, okay, because it's a change in time. And then there's dialogue. We get to verse 35, and then it says again the next day, all right, another change in scene. So it's another day now. There's some dialogue between John, uh, 
the Baptists and the disciples. And it goes on until verse 42 and 43 says the next day. So now it's a third day change in scene in verse 43 because we have a change in time. Okay. And then 43 goes on through to verse 51. Now we get, how do we know verse 51 is the end? Because notice verse one of chapter two on the third day, change in scene and actually change in story because now we go from this, these four days of dialogue at the um, uh, Jordan River to now we're in Galilee. So we're at a, actually a change in location as well and a change in time. The third day, meaning three days from when the last, you know, the last scene here. So three days later, which is the time it would have taken them to walk up to Galilee from Jerusalem on the third day. There was a wedding in Cana. So now we're in a different place. All right. And you go through the wedding in Cana. Now here, it's all one scene. So if you're teaching John 2, 1 through 11, you actually just have one scene. Because it's all at the wedding. And there's no change in characters. There's no change in time. There's no change in place. It's a, it's a dialogue and a miracle that happens all at one place. But then verse 12, after this, he went down to Capernaum change in location, and change in time. All right? That's like a summary conclusion. Now, change in time. The Passover was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Change in location. Now we have a new story, because he's going to go up and cleanse the temple. All right? So that's what you're looking for with these change in scenes. And in John 4, as I described to you, we see really, I think, an introduction Verses 1 to 6, and then three scenes after that. Okay, any questions on that? Now, Alex, you had mentioned, you had a question about the, set, the scenes in uh, your passage. Did you want to talk about that? Uh, my passage is John chapter 6, 1 to 14. And the uh, I'm not Feeding observing of the five thousand. Yes. Feeding of the five thousand. Yes, Pastor Bobby. Yeah. And I'm not seeing any change in change. scene. Yeah. Right. You have after these things, so we have a change in time. From the previous chapter. From the previous chapter, yes, of okay, course. Okay, so this, these two verses introduce the setting for, for this passage, right? You have the, the, a time in a sense. The time is after chapter 5, right? The place is the Sea of Galilee. Okay? And the situation yes. is there's a large crowd there. And then it says crowd Jesus following. went up yes. on the mountain sat down that's I, I think that's a change in scene uh it could just i think I verses one think. through four are just introducing the setting okay for you, all right because it's saying jesus you know after what happened in chapter five jesus went up to galilee and in galilee there's a large crowd and jesus sat on a hill with his disciples and then verse four John gives a, you know, the Passover was near. So it was getting close to Passover. So that's telling us also a time. But these first four verses are an introduction. And then verse five really begins what happens in the scene. So I would say one to four, I'd call that the introduction. And then verse five really begins the, what happens there. And really, it's just one scene, right? Yes, I think so. There's no change in time or place up to verse 14. So for your passage, you simply you have an introduction that gives introduces the setting. Who's there? When is it? Uh, where is it? And then verse 5 begins what happens there on that particular day at that place. Okay. 
Okay. So your scene analysis will be okay. pretty straightforward. You just have the introduction, describe it, what's said in the introduction. Okay. And then verses 5 to 14 are the scene. Okay. Now, okay. Alex, Alex, what you have to do, let me just give you a hint in your passage. Pay attention to what happens in the whole chapter of John 6. Okay. Because, and this is a super big hint, because actually verses 5 to 14, that story is preparing the reader for what's going to happen later in chapter 6. All right, so you're going to want to okay. make that connection. But as far as this assignment, just focus on verses 1 to 14. You don't have to do the whole chapter. Just yes. do scene analysis on 1 to 14. But I'm giving you a hint that uh, pay attention to the rest of the chapter as you're preparing, understanding the, the, the author's purpose for this passage. All right? I think he's setting up what happens later in chapter 6. Okay. Okay. Yes. I understand. Right. Thanks All for right, the good. tip. Good. Okay. Anyone else have a question on their specific passage? As far as as far as identifying the scenes. Yes, sir. Okay. And Selmo? Yes or no? Yes or no. Uh, in chapter six, sir, verse one to four, then the following verses. There is a change of character, sir. Andrew, like for example, then Philip, Philip first, then followed by Andrew. Yeah, but they're still, they're all together there. It's just one person speaking, Philip, right? But the other disciples were still there. So it's still part of one scene. When I say change in character, it's like the idea of the previous characters are all gone and new characters show up. That's not happening here. Uh, thank you, sir. Okay. Here, all the characters are there. It's just one character speaks, uh, and, then, and then another character speaks. And so, but it's still, if you picture yourself watching it like a play or a movie, you're going to see all of them there at the same time. All right? And then just one person speaks. Now, if you're watching like in John 4, if we were watching that like a movie, we would see Jesus talking with this woman. And then at some point she leaves and now it's just Jesus and the disciples. So it's a total change in who's there. Okay. That's what I mean by changing character. It's like uh, everything's different now because the people who used to be there now left and now there's a new group of people or a new person there. And the others are gone. So now it's sort of a new situation. But you don't have that in John 6. I think yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Good. Anyone else have any questions on the scenes for your passage? Okay, if not, we'll go to... Back to the assignment example. So first step, divide into scenes. Second step is now for each scene, uh, note those six aspects that I talked about. Now for the introduction, it's a little different. The introduction, just like in John 6, verses 1 to 4, you're just going to have an, a description of the introduction, a summary of it. Because in the introduction, he's giving the setting. He's giving you the time, the place, the situation. So just summarize that. And then in my story, John 4, scene 1 is verses 7 to 26. So I just identify the setting. That is where and when. So Jesus sitting at Jacob's well near Sukkar in Samaria at noon. Key characters. In this scene, it's Jesus and the Samaritan woman. All right. Now, key dialogue. Notice I just summarize key dialogue with a few key statements. So identify the verse or verses and just note what seems to be important statements made by the characters. Then in verse nine, uh, uh, in 
the next one is narrator. So I just note what I felt were important statements in that scene made by the narrator. The narrator said Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. The narrator indicated that the woman was alone. Uh, it indicated Jesus was alone. I felt those were important things he was saying in relation to the story. Okay. And then fifthly, after doing that, then I summarized the scene. And in this case, I just said, Jesus reveals he's the Messiah who gives living water that brings eternal life. Now, that doesn't include everything that happened in that scene, but it's what I felt seemed to be the important focus of the scene. I'm summarizing it. Now, I'm not giving theological statements. I, I'm not saying, so you must believe Jesus is the Messiah. No, that comes later when you preach the text. So right now, you're just simply identifying what is the author seem to be um, you know, uh, presenting as the, the, the summary of this particular scene. Not, not the theological summary. It's more of just the story. Does that make sense? You're not preaching the passage yet. You're just trying to study the story and understand the story. So what I found in this scene in the story was it seemed important was Jesus reveals he's the Messiah. And then he talked about giving living water uh, that brings eternal life. And I could have added and and he tells her what true worship is. I mean, I could have added that in, too. All right. And in comments, this is where you ever the thoughts that come to your mind that maybe don't fit in any of these first five categories. And in this case, I thought uh, the woman does not get the spiritual focus that Christ is presenting until he confronts her sin. Um, another comment or thought came to my mind. Jesus's discussion of true worship is foundational. So these are places you can put sort of your your theological ideas and thoughts just things that come to your mind as you're studying that scene, okay? And you'll just do this for each scene. Do those six aspects for each, each scene. In John 4, I had three scenes, so I did that. But like, for example, John 6, you're just going to have an introduction and one scene, okay? And in fact, that's probably the case for most of you. The wedding at Cana is actually just one scene and then a conclusion in verse 11. So I think for most of you, you probably won't have more than one scene. But like I said, like I told Alex, pay attention to what's happening before and after your particular passage. All right, as I mentioned before, you have to make the connection between your story and how it connects to what came before and what comes after. All right, and that's very important in John 6. For those of you that have that passage, but also John 2. What's the significance of that story there? And what came before it? What comes after it? What's the connection? And how does your story connect to the purpose of the book? But for scene analysis, this is all I'm asking you to do. Just, you know, analyze these the setting, characters, dialogue, narrator, summarize the point of the story in that scene. And then any additional comments that you have, observations, uh, thoughts, things like that. Any questions on step two here? Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. And again, I'll I'll uh, I'll attach this to uh, Facebook Messenger so you have this example again in case you can't find it in your your computer or anything. I'll send you this example again so you have it. All right, that's step two. So for John, I've got scene one. I do those six things. Scene two, again, the same thing, setting, character, dialogue. In this case, there was a lot of dialogue that I thought was important. And then the narrator, statements in scene two. Then the point, I summarize. And then notice I had, notice I had several comments on this particular one. And then scene three. And then the third step is very simply just take that point that you came up with with each scene and just put them together. 
So first, Jesus reveals to the Samaritan woman he's the Messiah who gives living water that brings eternal life. In the second scene, Jesus declares to his disciples the importance of seeing lost souls, proclaiming the gospel. And the third scene is many Samaritans come to believe. So I'm just summarizing each of these scenes. I just, I've already done the summaries. Now in step three, I'm just simply putting them together so they can see them in one place. And I probably should have put here uh, the introduction. John tells us that Jesus is in Samaria at Jacob's well near Sukkar at noon, and he is thirsty. Okay, that's the introduction, um, which isn't technically a scene, but it's setting up the story, so it's still an important part. All right, so include the introduction in your summary at the end. Okay. So step three is, is, you know, really just you've already done the work. You just need to, to compile those, those summary points into uh, one place. Step two is going to be your work. That's where you're going to put the most work in. That's, that's identifying those six uh, aspects of the scene. Step one is just reading through the story several times to identify each of the scenes. And again, for most of you, you probably won't have more than one scene in your passage. All right. Any questions, general or specific? Okay. I will assume that means that I am an amazing teacher and I was so clear that just everything you understand, there's no problem. So <laughs> I will just tend to make believe that myself because that makes me feel good. But uh, if you do, if you do come up with any questions uh, as you're studying your pat your scenes, again, as always, you're more than welcome to message me and and ask me those questions. And I'll try to help you as best I can, okay? Okay, any final uh, comments or anything before we head out to lunch? Pastor Tim. Yes. We are very, we are very appreciative of the way you are teaching us. You are very Great. considerate. Okay, long suffering, and all the all the fruit of the spirit we are seeing in you, Pastor Tim. Okay, we oh, do not you're... mean to flat. We do not mean to flatter you, but you know, what you're could speaking. we ask? No, you're... we have, we could not ask for more, I Pastor Tim. You're setting me up for something. True, Pastor Tim. Oh, we are very appreciative. Okay. This means a lot to us, Pastor Tim, really. Well, I'm glad. I, I appreciate that. And I really, really... Did, did uh, you notice, Pastor Tim? Did you that? notice, Pastor Tim, in the months that you have been teaching us, we have improved so much in our preaching? Yeah. Yeah. We've, I've cut, down, we've cut down time. We've become more focused on the topic. We've... Uh, Read ourselves of non-essential things. We as much, you know, more or less, we're right on the ball. Of uh, all those things are significant, Pastor Tim. Yeah, pre preaching stories is not easy. So, yeah, I definitely. Uh, uh, you've been asked to to really you know, approach this maybe in a way you've not done this before. Maybe some of you have, yeah. but really telling the story and then being able to show how that story is teach what it's teaching as far as the, the theological principle that that's not easy to do. So, yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate the work you guys are putting in and, and just try it, you know, don't, don't be afraid. Uh, yeah. You know, of, of not doing well, or, or the the goal here is to learn so we can do better. So, um, yeah. So any of my comments that I make on your sermons, you know, please, 
please don't get if if I give you a negative comment, please don't don't feel bad. I mean, just I'm trying to ex show you ways to do better. That's all. I. Uh, uh, me, Pastor understand. Tim. Me. We, under mm. we understand, Pastor Tim. Okay, good. Mm. Me, me, Pastor Tim. I appreciate your negative comment, Pastor Tim. Okay, so I'll give Very you more much. for the next one. <laughs> yeah, Pastor Tim. Uh, let me just read for you, no, because this this also involves you. You know, this is a this is a message from in messenger from a, a teacher in one of the uh, seminaries in Luzon, in Manila. And she watches our video stream, okay? Oh, Let really? me just read for you, Pastor Tim, for, for, for what it's worth before we sure. end. Here is to thank you for being God's instrument to encourage and instruct me. I watch the... Uh, Wednesday prayer meeting and the Sunday services and God graciously comforted me and ministered to me again. Thank you very much. Pressing on. Oh, that's great. This that's is great. a this is a teacher in seminary, Pastor Tim. Wow. Okay, so that's great. That's how you've been affecting us and how you have been affecting those who are listening to us, Pastor Tim. Praise the Lord. If it is if it is any word to you, Pastor Tim. No, I appreciate that. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, let me. I'll let you guys go. Uh, Pastor Noor, uh, could you close our time in prayer and pray for us this week? And appreciate that. Yes, 